This is lecture number 12 for Tuesday, May 12th, um, for History of the French Revolution. Um, today I'm going to take a little detour. I'm going to talk about the revolution and gender, because obviously half the people in France were female and half the people were male. And, and there's actually some very interesting ways that um, gender began to appear in the French Revolution. But in order to understand that, we have to sort of back up quite a bit and understand how gender functioned before the Enlightenment and before the French Revolution. Um, so that we can really see how it functioned uh, during the revolution. Um, and one of the things I want to just sort of frame this in is, for a lot of people, a key idea in the French Revolution was that they were going to destroy all the established hierarchies. They were going to get rid of the differences between the church and everybody else, between the aristocrats and everybody else, get rid of aristocratic privileges. They were going to create equality. And, and they even tried to, there are many who tried to create equality between races in terms of the colonies and slavery, abolishing slavery and all that in Haiti. Um, but gender remained an interesting question for a lot of people in the Enlightenment because, because for a lot of people, even enlightened philosophers, they thought that there was some sort of biological difference between men and women that was not there between aristocrats and peasants or between uh, blacks and whites, etc. And so gender was sort of a tough question. So I want to back up and just look at some of the older ideas about gender leading up to the French Revolution. Um, beginning it, it, for, for a lot of Western civilization, they did not understand gender the way we do. Uh, and in particular, Aristotle had argued that ma men and women are actually not fundamentally different in the sense of being totally opposites or something like that. Instead, men and women were seen as being on a spectrum of heat. And Aristotle argued that essentially every person had a sort of an intrinsic heat level and the hotter you were the more dynamic, decisive, bold, um, energetic, etc. you were. Um, so it was a personality trait. But Aristotle also argued that this had biological effects and in particular he argued that men were hotter than women. That, that, or, or to put it slightly differently, being masculine meant being hotter, and the hotter you were, the more masculine you were, and the cooler you were, the more feminine you were. And Aristotle did not think that men and women were somehow fundamentally different. Instead, they were simply different places on that spectrum of heat. And in particular, he argued that when a child was born or, or developing in the womb, if the child had enough heat to become male, the heat inside the body actually pushed the genitalia out to become a penis and testicles. But if the body was too cool that, for that, then there wasn't enough heat inside the body to push the genitals out, and they remained on the inside. But Aristotle argued, as, as a vagina and ovaries, etc. And but Aristotle actually argued that the genitalia of men and women were identical. They were just either pushed out or they were in. So a vagina was actually an inside-out penis, or a penis was an inside-out vagina, whatever you want, however you want to think about it. Testicles were exactly the same as ovaries. They were just you know, on the outside versus the inside, etc. The scrotum was the exact same thing as the uterus. It was just on the outside, not the inside. And so Aristotle argued, in, in, in fact, that there was not a fundamental break between men and women. There, there was simply this spectrum with really masculine men on one end and really feminine women on the other. In the middle, there was this sort of mass of people who were more or less feminine, depending on their heat. Um, and, and so, in some sense, Aristotle actually took from this, he said, women were sort of slightly defective men and that they didn't quite have enough heat to become men, right? And so he framed it as a, as a problem for women, not a problem for men or something like that. Um, but he did not see it as binary opposites, okay? And, and Aristotle's vision shaped how people understood gender throughout the Middle Ages. There were actually... Um, in the Middle Ages, there were actually lots of stories um, written by people who wanted, who presented this as actual factual truth of girls who who suddenly did something, someday jumped over a stream or something, and that stretched them enough that their genitalia popped out and they became male instantly. Um, they actually thought this was how it worked, right? Um, and they also did. They connected this to Christian ideas about sin and sex. Um, that basically men were thought of as being hotter and, the, and they connected this to the Christian idea that men had more self-control. Um, Augustine had argued, for instance, that Adam and Eve, you know, Eve had, had 
the serpent had convinced Eve to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She had shared it with Adam and he ate it. And they both had, and this is the original sin that had caused them to be cast out of the Garden of Eden. Um, Augustine had argued way back when, uh, in the, well, in the th late 300s, that, um, that Eve, that, that women are more sensual. And, and so Eve was, was not smart enough, essentially, to, be, to avoid being fooled by the snake. But Adam was smart enough, and, and his, his uh, mistake, his sin, if you were, was actually listening to his wife, who he should have been telling what to do, rather than, uh, instead of taking charge, he had listened to her and let her take charge, which was his problem, his sin. Um, Christians took this idea from Augustine, and, and they, they grafted on Aristotle in the Middle Ages, and so they basically came up with this idea that, that men were more intellectual, more decisive, more, more, had, had more moral f fortitude, and that they were the ones who were supposed to keep everybody from sinning, and that women were more sensual and were less decisive and cooler, and, and so women were actually more prone to temptation, right? And, and so it was up to men to sort of control women to prevent them from temptation. And in fact, women were often the downfall of men in medieval writing. That, that women tempt, that the devil worked on women because they were more malleable. And, 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 and then they would convince women to tempt men into sin. Um, so ultimately, in the Middle Ages, there was this idea that, that gender roles were actually sort of built into human nature. And, and they extrapolated quite a bit from this, that, that um, God had organized it and created human beings in such a way that men were supposed to be in charge. The male should be the head of the household. The female should be subordinate to him. Women were basically meant for child rearing and family, and men were meant for government and, and uh, the economic production, etc. Um, this was all built into medieval ideas about gender. Okay. Um, Beginning, though, in the Renaissance, you see a different conception of gender begin to emerge. And this is basically that during the Renaissance, people began to do a whole lot more study of the human body and human anatomy. And, and they basically began to argue that if you look at male and female genitalia, they really are not identical just on the outside and the inside. They're fundamentally different. And this led to a new conception of gender, and that was that the men and women are basically opposites, right? That they are either or. And this, there's a couple interesting things about this. Um, the first is that it, in the Middle Ages, it was thought that God had created souls as male and female, and then gave them bodies that reflected that. So the female body was a reflection of the female soul, and the male body was a reflection of the male soul. So male souls were more forceful and dynamic, and so male bodies were bigger and stronger, and female souls were more passive and, and less dynamic, it was thought, and so female bodies were weaker and, and less dynamic. Um, and so the biology for medieval, for medieval scholars, my, the biology was a reflection of a larger metaphysical point about souls, that male and female souls were different. Now in the Renaissance, you see that get switched that basically people start saying now that men and women are biologically different and that shapes their behaviors and their personalities. Right? And so the, instead of the, the soul shaping the biology, now it's the biology shaping the soul. But what, what, what emerges from this is beginning in the Renaissance, you start to see an argument made that men and women are fundamentally different and that they are fundamentally opposites. And the opposite part is key because Ever since then, especially since the 1600s, we have seen a trend in our culture to define men and women as opposites in the sense that whatever is true of men, the opposite must be true of women. And this gets used to create some gender stereotypes and, and gender roles that are, that are often, you know, even if there is some uh, intrinsic difference between men and women, it gets blown into an, an absolute black and white opposite. Um, and so, for instance, um, by, you know, and, and this is a long, slow process. That it begins in the 1600s with people arguing that men and women are biologically different. And, and by the Enlightenment, 
you start to see people saying, well, what does that mean about society and how we should organize society and things like that. And by the 19th century, well, after the French Revolution, you start to see Victorian gender roles, which are sort of the high point of this. And then in the 20th century, we start to question this and back off. But so in the 19th century, you get this real sense that men and women are fundamentally opposite and that they must be completely different. And, and so by the 19th century, you get this idea that men are rational and women are emotional, that men are cerebral and women are more sensual and physical, that men are self-controlled but women can't control themselves, that men belong in the public sphere out in the world and women belong at home, that, uh, that men work and produce things, women uh, raise kids and consume things or buy things. Um, and you can go on and on and on. There's a whole, whole list in the 19th century. By the French Revolution, we're not quite to that point, but it's getting there, right? So beginning of the 1600s, you start to see people say, well, maybe men and women are, are fundamentally different because of biology. By the Enlightenment, they're starting to say, well, men, maybe men and women are opposites. And, by the, and, during the, and, and the French Revolution has the beginnings of that. We'll see that after the French Revolution, we won't see it in this class, but take my gender and modern Europe class. Um, uh, we'll see that in the 19th century, gender roles have become defined by these sets of opposites. Right? So given that large sweep, what, what's going on specifically in the Enlightenment and then the French Revolution? Well, a number of writers, I mean, one of the key ideas of the Enlightenment was that we're going we're gonna to wipe away all of our preconceived notions and we're going to examine things scientifically and rationally and figure out the best way to do things or the, or the most scientific, ra rational way to do things. And, and so, in terms of gender, lots of writers said, well, let's throw away all the Christian ideas about men and women and Adam and Eve and all that, and we'll throw away Aristotle, and we'll just look, and we'll study what are men and women really like. And, and one of the key ideas here was that the Enlightenment thought that if you could find out what was natural, that was in some way good or the way things ought to be. That, if you, that, that, that things like Christianity or, or traditions are artificial, they go against nature, and that's why we have so much strife and problems in our society. If we can just find a way to live with nature in accordance with the way nat things naturally are, it'll be better. And so in the Enlightenment, a lot of writers said, well, let's figure out what men and women are naturally like, and then we'll create gender roles for society based on that so that everybody is doing what's natural for them. Right? And the idea was this would be better. Well, there were lots and lots of writers in the Enlightenment who talked about gender. I'm not going to go into all of them. You can take my Enlightenment class. Um, but I'm just going to mention a couple. Um, two uh, were major figures of the um, uh, were major figures of the Enlightenment, uh, and, and they were male. And you know, Kant was. I'm, I'm going to talk about Kant first, although he was one of the late last in terms of of um, actual uh, chronology, but. Kant, at the end of the Enlightenment, argued that if you look at men and women, he says, clearly, clearly, and this is just him looking around, um, there's nothing scientific about this, he says, men are made for noble thoughts. They, are, they, they love big abstract ideas and systematic thought, and they love science, and they love reason and philosophy, and etc. But women, he says, and this again is just him making stuff up, um, Women, he says, are only interested in, in pretty things, in aesthetics, in decorating houses and clothes and makeup and, and music and drawing. And, and so he says that basically this must be some sort of fundamental biological difference between men and women, that men are made for cerebral intellectual pursuits and women are made for aesthetic uh, pursuits. And therefore, traditional gender roles where women stay home and decorate the home and, and make themselves beautiful, etc., and men go out and do philosophy and science, etc., that's natural, and that must be the way it's supposed to be, right? So Kant just basically takes traditional gender roles and dresses them up in this idea of science and says it's natural, and then says let's keep going where we've been going. A little earlier was Rousseau, and I, I, I'm mentioning Rousseau second because he's he's really a, a really interesting and pivotal figure here. I mean, Rousseau, of course, was all about the democracy and the general will and liberating human nature, etc. But when it came to men and women, he had some very different ideas. Rousseau basically argued that if you look at the nature of man and woman, and, and here he he again sort of points back to natural man or man in a state of nature. <clears throat> 
He says that men are powerful and dynamic, you know, and, and, and strong and forceful and intelligent, and women are weaker and not as smart and not as able to control themselves and, and don't have the self-discipline. And so Rousseau says it's very clear that women, by nature, are dependent on men. He says, by nature, women can't take care of themselves. They need men to take care of them. But because women, by nature, are like this, they are also, by nature, able to appeal to men using their weakness and their beauty and their sexual allure to sort of make men care about them and take care of them. And so Rousseau's idea is that there's a natural order where women are dependent on men and men want to take care of women. And in fact, he even he, he goes so far as to say essentially that everything about women is now focused on manipulating men or, or pleasing men or getting men to protect them. And so fundamentally, he says, women are created for men's pleasure. All right? And so... Uh, he basically comes up with this idea that men and women are fundamentally different, and again, this supports traditional gender roles. Men should be out uh, you know, working and making their way in the world, and women should be at home taking care of children and, and being taken care of by a man. Now, one interesting point about this, and Rousseau makes a really, he has a, a way of stating things. Um, he, sa he has a great quote. He says, he says when he's talking, he's talking about sex, and he basically says, you know, men think about sex once in a while, and they have sex once in a while, but basically, for a man, he's only reminded that he's a man when he's interested in sex. Otherwise, he just thinks of himself as a person. But Rousseau says that for women, everything about them reminds them of that they are there for reproduction, right? They, they have their periods, and they get pregnant, and they have children, and they breastfeed, etc. And he said that basically, Everything about a woman's life is dominated by reproduction. And so his, his quote, and I'm paraphrasing here, but is, a man is only a man once in a while, but everything about a woman reminds her of her sex, at least until she's too old to bear children. And so Rousseau is basically saying that men are only reminded of their sort of physical bodies and their sexuality once in a while, and most of the time they get to go around just being sort of minds. They get to think about stuff and do things. But women are totally dominated by the process of reproduction. They're dominated by their bodies. So women are in some way physical and not intellectual, and men are intellectual and only occasionally physical, according to Rousseau. Right? So both Kant and Rousseau basically say, let's throw out all the religious justifications, let's throw out the story of Adam and Eve, we won't listen to Augustine, we'll get rid of all that, and we'll say, what should gender roles naturally be like according to nature? And they look around and they say, oh, well, traditional gender roles are all I see around me, so that must be what nature wants. Right? And they come up with a sort of an intellectual justification for traditional gender roles. The one exception to this, and there, there are actually several exceptions to this, but uh, I'm going to just uh, point to, um, to, to the, the most well-known one, and that's Mary Wollstonecraft. She's writing during the French Revolution, and she wrote in the, the mid-1790s uh, a vindication of the rights of women. And Wollstonecraft basically says, okay, Kant and Rousseau, <laughs> well, not Kant, because he's writing after that, but okay, Rousseau. Um, she says, you want to look at this and say, oh, women are all, you know, dominated by this, and they're all like this. And she says, you know, and Rousseau went on and on about how women are just sort of naturally into makeup and, and frilly clothes and whatever, and they're frivolous. Wollstonecraft says, do you ever think about this, that maybe... Sure, maybe women are all about clothes and child rearing and makeup right now, but maybe that's because everything in our culture teaches them to be that way. We give boys educations in science and philosophy. We don't teach girls that stuff. We teach them how to make clothes and take care of dolls. And maybe we should, and, and, we, and the way the laws are set up, men can go out, have to go out and make a living, but women can't, you know, do a lot of the jobs because they're, they're not allowed to, and they can't get an education because they're not allowed to, and therefore they're, the only way they can make a living is to marry a man who can support them. So, of course, they're going to be focused on marriage. So, Wollstonecraft is saying, basically, it's not that men and women are biologically different. It's that our society teaches them to be profoundly different. And they are profoundly different only because we teach them that. And then Wollstonecraft says, why don't we offer girls an education? Why don't we give them opportunities and see what would happen? if women actually have opportunities to go out and make a career and, and to study and a higher education, et cetera, would they still 
be interested in clothing and child rearing, et cetera, or would they be interested in careers and science, et cetera? So Wollstonecraft basically, I mean, well, put it this way, Kant and Rousseau said men and women are basically fundamentally biologically different, and that's natural, and gender roles are natural. But Wollstonecraft says no, men and women are not biologically different. Gender roles are socially created. Well, this will have important ideas, uh, ramifications in the French Revolution, because if they're going to totally change society and restructure society and recreate a new society, are they going to keep traditional gender roles? Or are they going to say, we're creating a new society, now is the moment to create new gender roles if it's socially constructed? So if they want to listen to Wollstonecraft, and, and I should point out, she's writing during the French Revolution and actually fairly late in it, um, if they wanted to listen to that idea, they would change gender roles and say the revolution is our moment to redo it. But if they wanted to listen to Kant and Rousseau, they're going to keep gender roles the same. I want to point to a couple of other things. So, so we have a couple things going on with gender. You know, you've got this switch from Aristotle's spectrum to the binary opposites. Um, you have Enlightenment writers who are trying to rethink gender in some ways. But there were also a bunch of social changes happening around gender during the 1800s, or the 18th century, or the 1700s. Um, one is that over the course, I'm going to be vastly oversimplifying here, but over the course of the 1600s and 1500s, the aristocracy was pretty focused on, on violence in a lot of ways. They, they fought a lot. There was a lot of wars. There was religious wars. There was all sorts of violence going on. But one of the processes that historians have noticed in the 1600s and into the 1700s is sort of what you might call the domestication of the aristocracy. And that is that aristocrats in the 1500s prided themselves on, on being warriors, on being fighters. And they didn't pride themselves on being very polished or polite or having good clothes or manners or anything. But by the 1700s, aristocrats really, although they still carry swords and they still do fight in wars, they, uh, an aristocrat is really now defined much more by how polished and sophisticated he is, right? That the aristocrats now wear really expensive clothing that's really, uh, you know, fashionable, and fashions are changing quickly, and aristocrats have to keep up with fashions. And, and now you have all these, you know, just as one example, when you go to dinner, you have like six-course meals, and you have all these different forks and spoons and everything, and aristocrats are sophisticated enough to know when to use this fork and when to use that fork and when to use this glass and when to use that glass. And it becomes a way of judging people. Are they sophisticated enough to handle this, right? And so aristocrats are priding themselves not on their military ability, but on their sophistication, right? And aristocrats now have to show off they've, they've got a certain amount of level of education and they can read and, and discuss great works of literature and they have to have finely decorated houses and they have to have fancy carriages and they're, they're judged on the, on the clothes of the uniforms of their, of their servants, etc. So... Overall, there's a sort of a shift from judging aristocrats on their ability as warriors and even priding themselves on being crude and violent to, by the, by the 18th century, aristocrats are priding themselves on being sophisticated, polished, genteel, right? And so an aristocrat's manners are actually what separate him or her from the people below them. Right? Aristocrats have better manners. They know all the secrets of social uh, niceties, etc., and lower class people don't. So this becomes a way the aristocrats separate themselves from the lower classes. But a number of people in the 18th, uh, 18th century noticed this, and, and they, they didn't like it. Um, in particular, Rousseau was a big one for this, but he basically said he, he complained about a feminization of society. That basically, he said, you know, aristocrats used to be, you know, ride around and go hunting on their horses, and they would fight, and they would, they would, you know, drink a lot and eat a lot with their fingers, etc. I'm, I'm Rousseau isn't actually saying this, but this is the gist of his argument. Um, my examples. Um, but now, you know, aristocrats go to salons and they sit around eating daintily and they wear frilly clothes and, and they, um, you know, they talk artificially and they, um, and they wear makeup and wigs and things like that. And, and everything is sort of artificial and, and nothing is natural. Um, but it's also, Rousseau argued, more feminine. Right? And remember, Kant and Rousseau are basically saying that you know, women are the ones who sort of 
are drawn to makeup and clothing and etc. And so Rousseau complained about the feminization of men, that they were becoming more feminine. And in particular, Rousseau and others like him complained that women, because men were now playing on the territory that was traditionally reserved for women, which is nice clothes and good manners and interior decorating, etc., that now women had more power. And in particular, in, in society, in, in, in political society, and this, goes, this connects to Furet, so keep in mind Furet here. The argument was that in the 18th century, aristocrats had gradually been sort of pushed out of having any sort of political power, they were just decorative. They just hung out at Versailles, and they, and they went to the balls and the, and the banquets and everything, and they, and they wore the fancy clothes and all that. But the argument is that the, the actual French government, the state, had solidified its power and taken power away from the aristocrats and had given it to a bunch of bureaucrats. But the center of all this is the king, right? The king is the one who makes all the laws. The king is the one who appoints all the, all the bureaucrats to run the government. The king is the, is the center of this centralized, powerful state. Um, but, and, and what that means then is that if you want to influence the laws or shift government, you can't run for office or, or join a parliament, et cetera. They're all out of, there's no, there's no power there. Instead, you have to get close to the king. Because if you can talk to the king, you can convince him to pass a law doing this or to give some money to that or to do, build something. Um, and so access to the king is political power. But in this system of the court and the, and the fancy balls and the fancy clothing and everyone at, uh, living at Versailles, etc., it's women who often control access to the king. It's women who hold the, who host the parties, and it's women who have, you know, access to the, you know, to the different aristocrats, et cetera, who, who, or the different uh, bureaucrats who might be running things. And so women, it was argued, have enormous power in this system of feminization that focuses on banquets and balls and dancing and, and you know, et cetera. Um, and so the argument was that under the monarchy, Virtually everybody had been sort of reduced to feminine roles, and, and to a certain extent, um, that the king presented himself as the sort of alpha male, and that made all the other men, all the other aristocrats and bureaucrats and everybody else sort of beta males, if you will. And that because, you know, Rousseau, remember Rousseau said women are sort of naturally dependent on men, well, everybody is sort of naturally dependent on the king. And so a lot of people, Rousseau foremost, had complained that the system of aristocrats hanging out at Versailles and dressing up in the fancy clothes and doing balls and banquets and things had really feminized everybody, right? Had destroyed masculinity, if you will. This is, you know, you can make what you want to of that, but a lot of people believed that at the time, and, and we'll see that there's a backlash against this during the revolution. So, what actually happens during the French Revolution? Well, the one, the one other thing that's really re closely related to the French Revolution and closely related to um, Furet is, you remember, a central part of Furet's argument is that because the king had consolidated all power to the centralized government and had sort of excluded the aristocracy from power, and it excluded the bureaucracy, I mean, the, the, the bourgeoisie from power, and nobody really had any access to what was going on in government. Government was seen as the king's private household business. And so there was no, there was no real sense of, you know, the, the, the government's business was public business, right? But during the Enlightenment, we had seen a whole lot of the, what you would call the growth of places where people got together to talk. And, and, and the... the um, the philosopher and historian Jürgen Habermas calls this the public sphere, the birth of the public sphere. He says during the 18th century, because of all these coffee houses where people would get together and talk about things in the news, etc., and because of salons where people would get together and debate scientific ideas, and etc., and because of the reading rooms and the birth of newspapers and the and the you know the, the spread of all these things, there are all these places where people now can meet up or communicate with people they don't even know about issues that affect all of society. And, and however, Mouse calls this the public sphere. And, and this is a crucial difference from what was there in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, there was, 
there was no thought that society as a whole had anything to talk about. There was, it was thought that if you were in the church, the church had church business, and people in the church talked about church business. And if you were in the guilds, the guilds would talk about guild business. And if you were in the government, the government would talk about government business. But there was no sense that there was anything that everybody in the church and the guilds and the government had to talk up to each other about. There was no sense that there were any public issues that needed to be talked about. Right? And so this, this creation in the 18th century of these places where people just sort of come together to talk about how society should be organized or what, you know, talk about economics or talk about you know, gender roles, etc., things that affect all of society, that's a new idea, this new public sphere. But as Puree points out, this new public sphere, the salons and the coffee shops and the, and the newspapers and the journals, etc., it's generating a whole lot of discussion about things that affect all of society, but it has no connection to actual government. Right? It's, as, as Fure points out, it's excluded. It's, it's, it's operating over here in abstractions and talking about what if, and then the government is over here in secret sort of running things. Right? Well, one of the things that happens in the French Revolution, which is huge, is that once the king's sort of authority and monopoly on power collapses. Once he calls the Estates General and asks them to debate the budget and taxes and things, he has opened up the government's business to the public sphere. He has said, now everybody gets to debate this, right? And, and suddenly everybody has to talk about things that are actually really real, like how do we run the government? And then once the National Assembly takes over, they really have to figure out how to run the government and the public sphere becomes really crucial. And here's where gender starts to come into it. Because one of the things that the revolution was about was destroying the old order. Right? The revolution was going to get rid of the corrupt monarchical system. And one of the things that they wanted to get rid of was the sort of politics of personal connection that had happened at Versailles, right? Everybody was sort of jockeying to get a moment with the king or with some influence maker, and everybody was, you know, using whatever, pulling whatever strings they could pull to get close to the centers of power, and, and often women were major figures in this because they were close to men who were ma major figures, etc. Well, the revolution is like, we're going to get rid of all that. And, and one of the ideas that really emerged in the French Revolution was the idea that we had to find a new form of power operating. And it had to be out in the open. It had to be above board. Right? And, and so one of the things you begin seeing in the French Revolution is this idea of authenticity. That, that in order to really be a good politician, a good revolutionary, you had to be authentic. You couldn't be faking it and hiding, you know, you couldn't be doing backroom deals and you couldn't be lying about things and you couldn't be saying one thing to one group and another thing to another group. You had to be authentic. That was what, you had to be honest and above board. That's the only way that a really democratic system could work is if everybody was really telling the truth all the time and being authentic. And so these two things together, let's throw out the old system and this perception that under the old system, women had power and there was a feminization of everybody, and this search for a new kind of authenticity to, came together <clears throat> in the French Revolution. And they created a new ideal that a man, politicians, who were all men, had to project a certain authenticity. They had to show people they were authentic. And this is part of the reason Robespierre became so popular, because he was so obviously not hiding anything. He was so obviously exactly who he said he was, right? And, but what's kind of interesting, you see this authenticity show up in all sorts of ways. Now, one is that politicians began to get rid of all the old fashions from before the French Revolution. They got rid of the, they got rid of the white wigs, although Robespierre, ironically, continued to wear one. But they got rid of wigs and they just wear their own hair and they stopped wearing makeup and they start and clothing started to get much less frilly with less um, you know lace and less you know and, and it became much simpler and so and this became a way of men sort of saying I'm an honest guy you know I'm as a politician I'm an honest authentic guy I'm natural right we're getting rid of everything artificial but this gets tangled up with gender 
because the, the previous system of artificiality and court system and all these artificial manners and politeness and fashions, etc., was seen as feminine. And so often in the French Revolution, you see this, this idea of authenticity get tangled up with the idea of masculinity. If artificiality is feminine, authenticity must be masculine. Or to put it, turn it around, if a man who's acting feminine is artificial, then a man who's acting masculine must be authentic. So if a, um, you can trust, I'm going to oversimplify here, you can trust a manly man, right? If he's direct and blunt and forceful, he's being honest because that's what a man is all about. That's authentic, right? And you see, in a lot of ways, uh, a sort of focus on authenticity. And, and this goes back again to Furet. That, remember Furet said there was a sort of this vacuum that emerges as the, government, the authority of the government just collapses, Nobody's sure who's in charge anymore. And the National Assembly is there, but who, who should they listen to in the National Assembly? There's like 1,200 people in the National Assembly. Who should be the leaders who emerge? And this idea of authenticity becomes a way for people to claim that they should be leaders. I'm an authentic guy. Listen to me. I'm not lying to you. I'm not being artificial. Right? And so authenticity, which is often presented as a sort of a gruff masculinity, becomes a way of, get it, of convincing people that you're a straight shooter, you're on the level, and that they should listen to you as a political leader. So authenticity and a certain gruff masculinity becomes a way of grabbing political power. Right? And, and I mean, think about how, how many politicians today go to the Iowa State Fair during the primaries and they eat corn dogs and stuff to show people that they're ordinary guys, that they're not artificial and they're just like you, as a way of sort of saying, I'm authentic, trust me, right? A similar thing is going on here. The politicians are saying, I'm authentic, I'm natural, trust me. And, but that gets tangled up with saying, I'm masculine. Because of that, you know I'm being direct and I'm being honest. Because I'm being macho, right? So <clears throat> there's a certain way that masculinity becomes tangled up with authenticity precisely because nobody's sure who's in charge. And so projecting this aura of natural masculinity becomes a way of saying, I should be in charge. It's a way of claiming some power. And Furet points out that in the National Assembly, the appearance really was the reality. If you could convince enough people that you were natural and authentic and, po and forceful, they would give you power and you could actually exercise power. If you could convince people you were powerful, you were powerful. And so essentially, Furet's point is that once, you know, in, once the, the authority of the king collapses, masculinity starts to function as a way of claiming power. Appearances become reality in the National Assembly, and masculinity is one way you can shape appearances. Well, how does this play out in the revolution itself? There's really two periods in the French Revolution, and, and I, I don't want to overstate uh, this because there's, you know, if you get into the details, it's not as clear cut as I'm going to make it here. But um, there's sort of two periods here. One is that before 1793, from 1789 to 1793, that four year period there, it really feels like there might be some changes in gender roles. There might be some significant shifts in gender roles. But then, from 1793 onward, the, that possibility, those, those openings get shut down, and traditional gender roles are reasserted. And oddly enough, or, or ironically maybe, it's often the most radical revolutionaries, the ones who are most dedicated to equality and change, who shut down gen, new gender roles most decisively. We'll see how it happens. So, before 1793, there's a bunch of ways that women are actually fairly heavily involved in the political process. Um, if you look at, I mean, women were actually present at the storming of the Bastille. Um, women were allowed into the National Assembly. They, they, had, they had these balconies in the National Assembly at Versailles where women could actually go there and watch the whole assembly. They could shout things. That, you know, politicians said something they'd like, they could cheer for it. And if a politician said something they didn't like, they could boo him. And so women were actually a, a presence in the National Assembly. And then when they moved the National Assembly to, to Paris at the Manège, women continued to show up there. And in fact, the galleries were even closer to the, to the action, so it became easier for women to sort of comment. Um, women were also heavily involved. We saw the October Days 
um, that is in, um, then that the the march to Versailles to bring the king back to Paris was really led by women, and it was women who stormed the palace. It was women who, who killed the Swiss guards, and and uh, so it was very much a sort of a power play by women. Now it was it was about bread prices, which was seen in society at that time as sort of a traditional area that women were in charge of. So it seemed like a sort of natural extent, uh, partic form of participation for women to care about bread prices. But it, it, nevertheless, women were, were clearly involved here. And one of the most interesting places that women show up in the French Revolution is in the figure of Olympe de Gouges. Olympe de Gouges, and that's a fake name she chose it for herself, um, Olympe de Gouges was a, um, was a playwright and a sort of a self-made woman. She was a writer before the revolution, and, and she was actually sort of the person, she sort of liked to make up personas for herself. She claimed for a long time that she was the illegitimate daughter of, a, of an aristocrat, which is why she took the name de Gouges, which implies an aristocratic name. Um, and when the revolution began, de Gouge really became very involved. She, she began to publish lots of pamphlets, and she'd get them printed up and hand them out in the street corners and sell them, etc. And in particular, when the, when, the, when the National Assembly came out with the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, de Gouge was kind of incensed that it, it overlooked women. And so she wrote a pamphlet called The Declaration of the Rights of Woman and Citizen. And in it, she basically went through the whole Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, and wherever it was specifically gendered, she changed it to include women. But what's kind of interesting is she, there were some key places where she really diverged quite a bit. One is, the, in the original Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, it says that men have the right to free speech. Well, in the Declaration of Rights of Woman and Citizen, Olympe de Gouche changes this to women have the right to free speech. They have the right to name the fathers of illegitimate children, which is an interesting twist on free speech. She basically says, if a woman has it, I mean, before this, if a woman had a child out of wedlock, if she wasn't married, the law basically said the child had no father. And there was no way that a woman could get the father legally to pay child support for a child if it was born out of wedlock. De Gouge basically says she's agitating for a law that would say that women could name the father when the child is born, and then that f they could take that father to court and try to get child support. He'd have to recognize the child as his. Um, or he could fight it in court and try to prove it wasn't his. Um, so De Gouge, uh, in that sense, clearly sees that the revolution, the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, sort of excludes women, and she's trying to include women in the political process, but she's still sort of caught up in the idea, not too far from Rousseau, that women are in, intrinsically connected to childbearing, right? Um, and so women's rights might be connected to that also. De Gouge was actually a monarchist. She did not want to get rid of the monarchy. And she actually addressed the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen. Um, she, well, she actually addressed in several pamphlets. She, she spoke directly to Marie Antoinette, the queen, and said, you need to speak up for women's rights. And so she's an, she's an interesting character here, um, and, and, and she's, a, she's a, an illuminating moment in the French Revolution because of what she's arguing for and how she's arguing for it. Other things that happened pre, in, up till 1793, I mean, the, the sort of high point is that you began to see, you know, we had talked about all these clubs, the Jacobin Club, the Cordelier Club, etc. Many of these clubs actually formed women's auxiliaries where they had a separate women's club that was the same club, but they met at different times. And then late in the revolution, they actually began to, uh, some clubs actually allowed women to come in and, and take part in club activities to be part of the political process. And women as sanculots were often in, involved in the sections and things like that. So women were actually, in many ways, pushing themselves into the political process. Um, the, maybe the high point of this was in February of 1793, a month after Louis XVI is executed, a group of women, form uh, radical Jacobin women, um, form a club uh, called the uh, um, the Society of Revolutionary Republican Women, and they they were really radical. They were like totally on board with the full Jacobin radical program, um, and they actually 
got weapons and began to patrol neighborhoods looking for suspicious anti-revolutionary activity, and they really saw themselves as a key part of the terror that they could go after aristocrats and counter-revolutionaries and reactionaries and use physical violence, right? On more, in more practical terms, the, the first part of the revolution did see several things that helped women legally. The National Assembly passed a series of laws. First of all, the National Assembly ended the idea of primogeniture. In, in French law before this, under the law, the oldest son always inherited everything from the parents. And this was to keep aristocratic estates together, but basically primogeniture was the law, which meant that younger sons and daughters never got anything. Right? Um, and so when they ended primogeniture, this meant that women, daughters, could inherit property from their parents, which in many cases gave women for the first time the opportunity to be financially independent. Right? Um, second, uh, women got the right to initiate divorce proceedings. The, the, under the revolution, they liberalized divorce laws a little bit so that divorce became easier to get. But most importantly, they allowed women to initiate divorce. Before this, only the man could initiate divorce. Right? Um, and Olympe de Gouges got what she wanted. The National Assembly passed a law saying that women could name the father of illegitimate children, and that father was legally then the parent of that child and responsible for that child in some sense. So in a lot of ways, it seemed up until 1783 like women were making serious progress here. The, the laws were changing their favor. They were involved in the political process in some ways. Um, they were never given the vote. None of the votes before 1793 allowed women to vote, but there were people demanding the vote for women. But after 1793, all that was shut down. And what's interesting is, is Robespierre, the, the sort of radical leader of the revolution from 1793-94, you know, is one of the most active in shutting down women in politics, of, of excluding women from politics. Um, and the reason for this has to do, again, with Rousseau. And it's not necessarily that Rousseau you know, said that women are taken up with reproduction or whatever. It was more that women were seen as, well, the, the, one of the ideas in Rousseau, and the general will, was that if everybody really wants what's good for the group, rather than what's good for them as an individual, and if they rationally assess what's good for the group, then everyone will agree and you will have the general will. Everyone will agree this is what the group should do. But, and Rousseau called that virtue. If you could put the good of the group ahead of yourself, that was called political virtue. Right? And it was based on reason. It was, the assumption was that if everyone was totally rational, they would all uh, come to the same conclusion, given the same circumstances. And, and Robespierre really believed that. Right? Um, but, Women were seen as taken up with the family. They were taken up with their children. And one of the assumptions was that women, in fact, were so protective of their children that they could never put the good of the larger society ahead of the good of their own children. And so the assumption was women could never have what's called political virtue because they could never think about what's good for the whole society rather than just what's good for their family. And so the assumption was women could not be rational in the way that was required for politics. And Robespierre laid this out. He basically said, women can't have political virtue. And so we, we have to exclude them from politics. And, and this comes into contact with the idea of authenticity as masculinity, that women are somehow artificial, that women represent backroom deals and, and shady dealings and influence and string pulling. And so we have to get women out of politics because then we won't, have we won't have authenticity as long as women are in politics. And so there's a couple of different things that come together here to create this idea amongst even the radicals that women should be excluded from politics. And so what you see in, in practice is that Robespierre in particular was really hostile to women in politics. And the radicals tended to try to exclude women from politics, especially during the terror when there's a whole lot of violence going on. Um, and, and women were often part of the crowd storming the National Assembly. Everybody in the National Assembly wanted, one of the ways they could cut down on the crowds was to bar women from entering the National Assembly. Well, a number of things come out of this. In 1793, the National Assembly bars women from speaking. 
Well, Lambda Gush had actually addressed the National Assembly earlier, but now all women are barred from ever speaking in the National Assembly. Um, in 1793, Olympe de Gouche herself is beheaded. She's called a monarchist and she's executed, although it wasn't clear that she'd done anything. Um, but, um, and then women are actually excluded from even being in the National Assembly. They're not even allowed to be in there as spectators. And then in 1795, there's a bread riot and the, and the, the, the director at the directory actually excludes, it confines women to their homes. They say women cannot leave their homes. And then later there's just a curfew on women. They can't be out after a certain hour or whatever. But women are essentially excluded from public. They're actually kicked out of the public sphere altogether. They're not allowed out of their homes, and they're not allowed into the National Assembly, etc. And, and this shows up in laws also. Um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but you know when Napoleon takes over in 1799, he begins writing a new set of laws for France. It's supposed to be rational, an entirely rational legal code written from the ground up. Um, it's called the Napoleonic Code, and it's still basically the law of France today. It's also the law of Louisiana. Um, but under the Napoleonic Code, women are essentially reduced to second-class citizen status. First of all, women can't vote, and you know they never had been able to before that. But um, but in addition, women now are not allowed. They're treated as minors under the law. They're not allowed to sign contracts in their own name unless it's co-signed by a husband or a parent, or a son, a man in their lives. Um, women are, the, the, their rights to initiate divorce are, are reduced now under the Napoleonic Code. A woman can only ask for a divorce if her husband not only is having an affair, but he brings the mistress to live in the wife's house. That's the only way a woman can ask for a divorce. Right? If she knows her husband has 13 mistresses and he's sleeping with 13 different women, Outside of the house, she has no grounds for divorce. But if, if the husband brings one of the, wife, one of the mistresses to live in the house, then the wife can ask for divorce. But that's the only circumstance, right? Um, and so essentially, and women need to have a guardian, a male guardian at all times. So essentially, what has happened here is that women have been, again, pushed out of the public sphere and reduced to second-class dependent status. And, and Rousseau would undoubtedly have approved of the Napoleonic Code because... It, 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 in Rousseau's eyes, it recognized that women were dependent on men. So overall, gender actually had an, a significant role to play, especially in this period of chaos in the early revolution, where it's not clear how people, how they should recognize people as leaders in the National Assembly. Masculinity and authenticity became sort of tied up together in this way of showing that you were an authentic politician who was telling the truth and were honest. And the idea of citizenship itself as this sort of political virtue got tangled up with gender roles. And so there's a real, there's actually a, a very real way, it's kind of subtle, but a real way that what happened during the French Revolution was that political power and being a politician and, and speaking for the nation became defined in terms of masculinity. And so women, by definition, could not be politicians because they, because they were women, they were feminine, and femininity was the set of characteristics which excluded one from being a politician ex exercising power. So overall, the French Revolution offered promise for changing gender roles. And in many ways, we'll see that some of the gender roles that were banded about in the French Revolution would come up again later, a century later, when women really would get the vote. Um, but for the moment, the French Revolution actually seemed to, it opened the door for women to enter politics and have more rights, and then it firmly slammed the door.